welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us for our uh, VPSA chat. This is our third one for this biennium. And um, uh, for those of you who haven't joined us before, uh, the idea behind the VPSA chat is to uh, find a way to engage our students on topics that um, are affecting our students' lives and, and hopefully bringing in more voices to kind of give you some tips, suggestions, and some insight to those who have dealt with things or who have worked through things, who have professional knowledge on, on these topics to help us out. And today we're very excited to bring in our uh, past national president, Adam Cantley, um, to, <laughs> to uh, talk on some, some important uh, self-care uh, topics such as mental health, stress management, and, and mindfulness. <clears throat> so um, Adam, uh, I'll go ahead and let you take it through. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Great. Well, thank you all for being here, brothers. Great to see you. I don't know. Maybe we have some sisters. I don't know. We, anybody can come, you know, so uh, excited to be here with you today. So as Bong said, my name is Adam Cantley, past national president for Kappa Kappa Psi. Um, I was uh, on the National Council from, I think it started in 2005 as VPSA and then eventually became president in 2011, 2013. Um, professionally, I work at the University of Delaware where I am uh, the Dean of Students. So I work a lot with student advocacy, crisis support, parent and family engagement. Um, I oversee our Office of Student Conduct and uh, Disability Support Services. I supervise the directors of those areas as well. So yeah, uh, a lot of the work that I do um, and that we handle in our office is students who are in need or who are in crisis or who are having impact on mental health, uh, how that affects their academic, personal, or social experience here at the university. So that's a lot of the time that I spent working with colleagues. And the one thing that <clears throat> I always like to start when I have these conversations, I am not a licensed counselor. I am not uh, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and I think that's really important to kind of put out there straight out the gate. I, I work with a lot of those folks and collaborate with them, and a lot of the information that I'll talk about today is stuff that colleagues have helped me develop. Um, my colleagues, uh, Zach Ellison and Julie Garson, who have worked here at the University of Delaware, both counselors in our, uh, our counseling center here have helped me, and um, a lot of just training that I've went to, but I think it's really important to say not a counselor, and if that is support you need, or we'll talk about why you should connect to that and how you can connect to that. Um, and really some of the advantages that you have being a current college student and having often um, good access to mental health support more than um, folks who are not currently enrolled in it. Cool, so um, I think what we're gonna talk about today, and um, I, can deliver content, but I also love conversation. So I'm gonna move my mouse. I'm gonna open up the, the chat window um, to the right on my screen for Zoom. So if you have questions, please put them in there. You can also um, feel free to interrupt and um, unmute yourself and, and engage in that way as well. So I will start maybe just kind of delivering content and some things, but ultimately I really hope we get to engage in a good conversation. Um, some of the things that I think uh, I hope you gain from this is to really just think about your mental health stress and how you are coping with that in a real way. Um, a lot of times I think people assume that stress is bad and not all stress is bad, um, but stress can help us be motivated, stress can help us get focused, um, but it's when that stress becomes uh, a dominating force and leads to other issues, then that's when it becomes bad. But stress in itself, not, not necessarily bad. It can really be helpful and help you be more productive. Um, but when it overtakes, that's when we have to, to think about it. So um, we're going to start maybe by talking about just awareness of stress and how do we know when it's gotten to a place where maybe it's not um, productive or healthy for us. So if we think about stress, there are four ways that we can think about how it manifests in ways that we can see it. So first of all, it's just physically in our body, um, in our mind, in our emotions, and in our behavior. So those are the four ways we can think about how stress may manifest um, and give us kind of clues that maybe things are not going in a healthy way. So talk about just body. Um, and I would love to hear from some of you all, and you can maybe throw them in the chat window there. What are some things that you know physically about yourself whenever you are overly stressed or maybe your stress is at, at a high level? What are some 
things that you physically feel or happen to you that maybe you could throw in that chat window and um, see if you're kind of on the same page that I'm on. So thinking about how stress maybe physically manifests in you. One example for me is I um, get a headache. I get stress headaches if I'm not too careful. Um, oh, Hunter took my answer. Great. Hunter says headache. <laughs> People getting shortness of breath. Absolutely. That's another one that's out there. Um, anybody out there get the old uh, up, upset stomach or maybe feeling tightness in the chest? That's on extreme nausea. Yeah. Those are all things that, that happen. Um, and those are signs that, you know, we need to be aware of. I think so many people try to push them away, um, but kind of just being aware and being present when those are happen happening and knowing that they're happening and is that becoming more frequent than not frequent? And those are the things that, that we kind of have to think about. Um, a lot of people get just tight muscles, um, skin irritation, some people break out in like hives. I used to be a really bad um, hive breaker outer whenever I would present. It was weird and I love doing it, but I would just automatically flush red. It was weird, um, but things like that. I think the other thing is, is sometimes that even manifests to where you're just your immune system runs down and you're getting frequent colds. And um, I, I used to be the worst of the finals cold catchers. <laughs> Whenever I was in college, I would always catch a cold or feel ill around finals time because I just wasn't taking care of myself. And that's a, a really important thing to think about. So other signs, we talked about body being one of the things that um, you can notice when stress is maybe becoming unhealthy or too high. Another is just your emotions, um, <clears throat> irritability, um, mood swings, losing confidence in yourself, sadness, apathy, apprehension, anxiety, um, feeling overwhelmed, out of control, helpless. Um, those are all real feelings that, that people have associated with stress. And they're normal feelings. I think a lot of people assume um, and I believe wrongly that if you're stressed, you should be anxious and you should be worried. No, for some people being stressed just makes them sad and they're, they're upset. They can't handle what they, they handle. The important thing to know is when you're stressed, um, to take time to think about how those emotions come out in you, because it is going to be different for everyone. So I think a lot of us mess up maybe with our friends when they're like, I'm so stressed. I feel like blah, 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 blah. And they're immediately like, well, that doesn't mean you're stressed. That just means you're this, you know? No, that, that means they're stressed. And maybe that's how that's manifesting in their emotions. We can't assume the way that we feel stress in our emotions is how other people feel stress in their emotions. And a lot of times they just want to talk to you and tell you about it. <laughs> and as a good friend, you can just say, I'm sorry that that's happening and I hate that you feel that way. How can I help you? I mean, that's really all they need to hear from you. You don't need to rationalize it for them. Um, so really thinking about your emotions and the re reason why we, we think about our emotions is times uh, when we're stressed and those minor stresses, if those continue, um, if you're consistently feeling overwhelmed because of your stress and that's been an overwhelming feeling for five days or longer, sometimes that leads to larger concerns and sometimes people can't get out of those ruts and that's why we got to seek help we've got to tell somebody hopefully to get the help that we need to get out of that so um don't push those emotions away um i would say you know recognize those emotions for what they are in your stress and then think about how um you can manage your stress and manage your emotions and getting the support that you need so body emotions We'll move on to our mind and kind of some of the cognitive things. Um, who is like me that when you're stressed, you can barely remember your own name? I, I, I just forget things. Things like pop out of my brain. I'll be sitting there and I'll be in this meeting and I'll be like, yeah, we really need to focus on um, – um, what's that called? And they'll be like, our job, Adam. I'm like, yeah, our job. <laughs> so I just get really um, forgetful when I'm stressed. I don't um, put enough time into my thoughts because I'm too busy trying to move as fast as I possibly can. And then information just shoo, vanishes. Um, some people have impaired judgment. Um, some people, even it affects like their dreams, they get nightmares, they have uh, indecision, negativity in their thoughts, um, sometimes trouble concentrating. Um, if I'm really stressed, uh, I know that I will open an email to do one very specific thing or I'll open a file and then I'll be like, oh, over there, I'm like a squirrel with a shiny object because I'm just trying to do everything in front of me um, and it's really affecting my ability to do what I actually need to do. Um, one of the things that I have to do when I'm stressed and I'm, I'm working because I, I, 
I got to make a paycheck. I don't get to go home. So <laughs> I will literally just open up a project or whatever. And I'll be like, you need to turn off everything else. You need to close out all the other windows on your computer, flip your phones over. You know, you really just need to focus on that. And a lot of times that's what's stressing me out the most. So getting that off my to-do list helps me think about those other things. So really thinking about how stress affects your, your thinking and how you approach your work is really important as well. So body, emotions, mind. Last is behavior. And a lot of this is kind of tied to some of those other things. Um, no, no shame in the game, but who's a stress eater? There are people who are stress eaters. There are people who, <laughs> I am too. Uh, there are people who don't eat. Um, they, they lose the appetite. Um, unfortunately, some people begin abusing substances when they're, they're stressed to kind of cope as a coping mechanism. Insomnia, restlessness. Um, people get more accident prone. <laughs> That's another thing because you're just trying to go so fast to manage everything that you end up falling over your own two feet. It could be the calmest of calm days and I will fall over my own two feet. Um, <laughs> and they just tend to be impulsive. You make decisions that maybe you wouldn't make um, in the future because, you know, or you wouldn't make if you were less stressed because you just want to get something done. You're like, this is, this is the quick answer. This will get it done. So sometimes you're a little bit more impulsive in your behaviors. But the things that I would say about that <laughs> um, is to really think about, you know, these ideas of body, emotions, mind, and behavior and kind of how those play out. Um, the important is that what we need to start doing as people and what really help us with our own mental health and kind of mindfulness is just being aware of how stress affects our body. And I don't think a lot of people are. So in instead of just shoving it away, maybe just kind of sitting in that moment and realizing, oh my gosh, this is because of how stressed I am and um, how can I better deal with this or move forward in a different way? Um, as a, one of my <laughs> friends says, our st stress in our body is just like a, a gas pedal and it just phew, helps us, you know, basically take off. And sometimes that's not in the most informed direction or it's not in the way that we want to go and it's not really being our best self when it becomes too high of a stressful situation. So really taking a minute to recognize that and relax is kind of the brake pedal that you can apply. Um, because um, a lot of times things that are stressful, there's opportunities for us to slow down and we're not comfortable doing that as human beings. But if we can be, a lot of times it leads to less stress and a better product of what we're trying to do and us being more healthy. So really taking those times um, to think about um, how to, to do that. So any questions about any of that, I will, I will pause there. That was a lot to put out there, just kind of about how stress affects the, the body, mind, emotions, things like that, um, and why we need to kind of be aware of that. Does anybody have thoughts or questions? Looking. If you're typing, give me a nod. No one? Great. Um, <clears throat> so when we have this, a lot of times people ask me, what is the best way to cope with stress? And quite simply, the answer is there is no best way for everyone. It is important to kind of figure out what that best way is for you. Um, so I would love it if you on the side would type um, what is the best way that, that you cope with stress? Um, and we can start sharing those. So put that in that chat on the side and I'll share some of those out. Um, for me personally, <clears throat> um, actually music is how I cope with stress. I um, have a stressful job. I'm dealing with people in crisis and in tough situations. And I used to listen to like podcasts and audio books on my way home. And I would um, I have like a 25 minute commute and I would keep my mind engaged. And then I just realized like, you know, I really just need this time to de-stress. So I will sing songs very loudly in my car and have people look at me oddly at stoplights on my way home. Or um, another thing that helps me de-stress is my friends and family. So I use my commute, not necessarily to work, it's early, but on my way home from work, I will call and check in on my mom, my sister, actually my brothers, um, and, and just learn more about their days. And having, I'm an extreme extrovert, like really extroverted. Um, so having those connections with people would be there. Um, some of the things that are out there, um, gym and music, uh, herbal tea and putting, oh, essential oils. I love an essential oil diffuser. Running, music and tea, everything lavender. Somebody's sleeping with it, spraying it on their clothes, wearing even the color. They love lavender. Um, eating, hiking, uh, hiking in Yosemite, so specific. Uh, drinking coffee, um, really just thinking about nothing. Um, my family, walking and 
jogging. So those are all great ways. So important things, you have to recognize what stresses you and how it affects your body. You also need to take some time to figure out what helps you de-stress. I don't think anybody really told me to do that. People would just say, chill out. And that's like my least favorite thing, like chill out. Well, what does that mean? It means nothing. I'm not going to go hang out in a refrigerator. Um, so how do you actually get to a place where you're relaxed and thinking about what those are and knowing when you need to engage those? That's nothing that anybody um, can tell you to do, but sometimes you just have to invest in time and doing that with yourself. And if you're not sure how you can do that, or you're not sure really what to do, that's why seeking help from counselors and other folks to help you build up those skills is really important. So um, <laughs> the other thing that I really has me um, is kind of um, the power of thought and how we change our thoughts around stress and mental health. Um, a lot of times when we get in stressful places, we catastrophize and that's normal. Like, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing ever. I'm sure we've all said that once or I am terrible at my job. I'm a bad musician. I'm a bad brother. Like, and it's, it's, it's not that far down the road, hopefully, but that's just where that internal gas pedal of stress has put you. A lot of people go to all or nothing thinking, I either have to do everything on my to-do list or I can't do any of it. What are you doing, Russell, with your camera? <laughs> um, things like that. Um, people start reasoning out of emotion and I'm an already an emotional thinker. Like I think with my heart, probably um, an unhealthy amount. I'll own that. But I, I come from a place of emotion as a human being. So I really have to make sure that it doesn't go all emotion whenever I'm, I'm stressed. Um, we jump to conclusions. Oh my gosh, they're not texting me back. They clearly hate me. They don't want to talk to me more. They're no longer my friend. What have I done? They're so mad at me when it might be they're just in class or it's, you know, midnight or, you know, it's, it's things like that. Um, we really start to jump to conclusions and things like that. And then we start thinking, well, I should have done this. I should do this. Um, and living in that should space. So instead of that, we need to start kind of thinking how we can reframe those thoughts and how can we hopefully help ourselves think a little bit more positively instead of going to those places. And it takes practice, right? And it's not something that we naturally do as people. Um, so it takes practice, which we are all familiar with as a concept. So <clears throat> I think tis the season and not to hopefully add stress to anybody, but it's finals and exams are coming up. I'm sure you guys are all at a pretty good baseline of stress right now. If you're like the students on my campus, it's just a stressful time. Um, how many of you uh, have said, I'm going to fail this test? Like, like you've walked into a test and you're just like, I'm going to fail this. I've said it. I've said it so many times. Um, and sometimes that is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and how can we start to rethink about how we might say that differently? So whenever I will go into a meeting or a presentation, I used to be one of those people like, this is going to be terrible. I'm not going to do well. It's going to be bad. Instead, I try to think to myself, you know what, I'm usually nervous before things like this, and most of the time they turn out to be really great and okay, you know, and, and starting to think about, acknowledge the fact that yes, you have anxiety about a test, and that's not wrong to have, um, but you don't really know the outcome, and if you have prepared, you can say, you know what, I'm I'm, it's okay that I'm nervous. I'm sometimes nervous before a test and it's going to be hard, but I've done what I can to prepare. And that's just where I have to be with it instead of just kind of living in this failing space. Um, let's think about some other ones. Uh, a lot of times if you were like me in college, um, you had to make a lot of choices between like hanging out with friends or studying. And um, you're, you're always in this point. Like if I take a break to see friends, I won't do well. I'll fail, things like that. Some people kind of live in that space. Um, so what's maybe a way that you could reframe that thought? Instead of saying, you know, if I, if I take a break to see my friends, I'm not gonna study and I'm not gonna do well in classes. Um, what's something that maybe somebody could share a way that you could reframe that in maybe a more positive way? You can either write it, you can speak it, you can unmute yourself, whatever you, what you got for me, Hunter? It's too long to type, but um, whenever I'm anxious about studying, it uh, really helps me to remind myself about graduation. Like studying isn't just studying to pass a test. Um, studying for my classes is really putting the investment in myself because yeah. there is no better investment than investing in yourself. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm furthering my life by completing this class and completing my college career and going on a new career. Yeah. 
I, I think that's fine. And, you know, thinking about the goal that, that you do have, like it is important for me to, to take time for myself and to study. And, and this is why I'm doing that. That's a great way to reframe the thought instead of being uh, like that. Jessica, Jessica's iPhone. I'm assuming that's Jessica Lee, maybe. Uh, says, remembering that uh, the most productive people take breaks. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the things that I always would say is that um, sometimes breaks are really good just to kind of get you out of a study space and, and kind of away from your, your material and content and then come back in with a little bit more energy. And it's Jessica Needham, sorry, Jessica. Um, and, um, and gets you the opportunity to look at something in a new light in a different way. So, um, you know, I think that, that that is a perfect way to think about that too. Um, I'm a big believer in the break. So um, I'm also a social person. So I know that I get my energy. I'm, I'm good. I'm like, why maybe I can invite people to study with me and we can work together and, um, and thinking about how you can put those two things together. So it doesn't have to be this all or nothing kind of thing. And really thinking about things from a place of how, how can I think about this just a little bit more healthily than, Oh, this is the worst thing ever. Um, one of the things that people say, especially um, going into situations that maybe seem normal is like, I shouldn't be anxious right now. Why am I so anxious? It's terrible that I'm anxious. Um, you know, what's maybe a way that you could reframe that? I think the, the first thing that I would say is that it's just, it's normal to be anxious about things. It's 100% normal. Um, I spend a lot of time talking with students and um, they're like, this seems like a lot. I don't know if I'll be able to, over and one of the things I'm like, that's, that's fair. That's fine to feel that way. I get it. This does look like a lot right now. Um, but have you overcome hard things in the past? Well, yeah. Well, let's talk about what you used back then to get over this and how can we use those skills that you already have to help you kind of think about um, what's ahead of you. Um, it's okay to feel anxious, totally understandable. Um, <clears throat> but if you have faced challenges in your past, what can you pull from those experiences to help you face these challenges? So doing your best to not let your mind live in that anxious place is very hard. And I think we've boiled it down to something very simplistic in these just short conversation pieces, but that's the way you need to start thinking and hopefully helping yourself think about things a little bit differently. Um, it's important that you're honest with yourself when you do that. Um, and it's important that if you need help, um, it would be really, um, important to access that. Somebody wrote, uh, as a bio person, I'm always remembering the flight or flight response. My body may be telling me uh, a line is chasing me <laughs> and tell my mind that it's not hap that that's not happening can help, you know? So your body is all ramped up, but like, Oh, Steve Nelson's here in the form of Jessica Lee. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, while your body is telling you all these things, taking a moment just to breathe and kind of think about things rationally um, is really helpful. I think that's a great point. Um, Hunter, I've always been told that your body gets anxious when you're gearing up to face a problem and that your body is overprepared for the problem when it's anxious and it usually turns out fine. Yeah, I think as we say, when a lot of people are stressed, they're not necessarily in their most rational space. So um, how can you just take a moment to breathe and to pause and, and to do what you need to do to recenter yourself? Um, I think a lot of us are really unforgiving of ourselves to give a, ourselves that break. I think the other thing specifically within the context of, of the fraternity, uh, especially you are, I mean, you're here, you're spending time at 11, 11, 12, 10, whatever time it is in your part of the country to have this. It tells me that you're probably very engaged and you are committed to the organization. Um, sometimes we forget that we have a whole team of brothers to help support us too, and that we don't have to do everything and that we all signed up to support one another. Um, and that can also be a good reminder that, you know what, I have all these things to do. I'm really stressed. Take a minute. What are the things that are most important for me to really work on and how can I use that network around me um, for the fraternity to help me out too. Um, so yeah, I, a lot of this just kind of boils down to reframing thoughts and kind of taking some time back. Um, so when you're doing this reframing of thoughts, um, it's just important to start to observe and notice your unhelpful thoughts. Um, I am a quick catastrophizer sometimes and I really have to in myself. I can be like, 
I got it off from somebody and they seem upset and then I'll be like, oh my God, I'm getting fired tomorrow. Like <laughs> I have to be like, I'll go down that train very quickly. Um, and I used to be that person, but now I'm like, okay, they're clearly upset. What can we do to solve this problem? It's probably something that we can get to a solution on. I need to make sure. So I have to notice when my, my thoughts go to this kind of catastrophizing place. As I said, I'm really extroverted and really concerned about people around me. So I'm, I, if somebody says something negative, I was like, they clearly hate me now. Like, you know, it's, it's probably not. They're just upset about what I said, or maybe I just challenged them or, you know, you just have to really think about those thoughts. And when they, when they start to come, how can you start to reframe and notice that and just practice reframing? This person isn't mad at me. They are clearly just upset because I chose to do something differently than that, what they would do. And they think their idea is better, which is fine. Um, so how can we find a solution and get working on the same way? It's really hard to do that in the moment. So that's why all these things take practice um, and take time to kind of develop. Um, a lot of this boils down to this concept of mindfulness. Has people heard about this concept of mindfulness and what that means? Who's heard of it? Would anybody want to share a thought about what they, <laughs> Hunter says no. Uh, anybody want to share a thought of what they think that means or what mindfulness might be? You can speak it or type it. Uh, Lacey's got me. Thank you. Hello. Um, honestly, the concept of mindfulness, uh, for example, the our um, chapter is a big group of anxious beings, um, <laughs> but we're always mindful of each other and how, um, you know, like certain words can affect each other um, or like how this one thinks, how this one acts, like... Uh, I'm really bad with butchering words, but yeah. <laughs> Just being, you're about present one another kind of, well, absolutely. Hey, that's great. Thank you. Anybody else have thoughts that they would want to share on that? Looking, I'm looking. No. So I think really that's a great uh, kind of uh, example of what mindfulness is, Lacey. It's really just about being present in the moment that you're in um, and not thinking about what you could have done differently and not thinking about what's ahead. Um, I, it's weird. It's weird. Are you ready? The time I practice mindfulness the most is in the morning when I'm getting ready for my day. And people are like, why? And I was like, because the moment I wake up, if I'm not careful, all of a sudden I'm thinking about what's happening at 4 PM and, and I am focused on my own right what I'm getting ready to do the entire rest of the day so one thing I used to do every morning is while I was well, let's not say I was ironing it depends on the day it was either ironing or putting my clothes in the dryer with a wet gouache cloth pretending like I ironed it um, I would sit there and I would tell my phone to read my calendar for the entire day to me and then I would freak out I was like, oh my gosh, I have so much to do. And so now I'm at the point where like, you know what, Adam, your job for the next hour is to get yourself awake, do what you got to do, take care of the dog, and then get on the road. And you can check your meetings and things like that when you get in. Nothing's going to happen in that 45 minute period that's going to make or break. Um, and really just kind of focus on what I'm doing. When we kind of focus on what we are doing, um, one now, the idea of getting ready should not be a heavy mind lift, hopefully. Um, but if we are focusing on what we are doing right now, um, it allows us to actually be present and give everything we can to that. I was trying to bring up for like, hold on, give me a minute. I need to close out all the other windows on my computer. And I like turned my phone over and turned off my Bluetooth so my watch wouldn't buzz so that, oh, that reminds me, my phone needs to be on silence. Do not disturb. Um, so, you know, I, I did all of that so that, that I could be kind of present in this moment and not worried about the other things that, that were, were going around and so that I could give my full attention to you all. The thing is, when we think about the past, sometimes we think about the past in fun ways, but a lot of times that comes with remorse or coulda, woulda, shouldas, and I wish I would have done this differently, or I could have set that up, and we kind of get into a bad space. And sometimes when we think about the future, sure, it can lead to excitement and positives, um, but sometimes it also leads to fear and worry, like, oh my gosh, I have to get ready for this. Um, but a lot of times, if we just kind of stay where we are and think about what we are doing in that moment, we have the ability um, to really kind of tackle that and, and be more present and be better equipped to do what we need to do at that moment. Confident mindful that 
uh, I would say. Uh, some of my friends and I um, that I work with, we started talking about a couple years ago and how it applies to what we do and how we can better employ that. And I think it's a really um, good thing to do. So what I would say, we won't do it right now. I don't, I don't know how a mindfulness activity would work basically via Zoom. But what I would just say in the future, how you start to practice it is just to set aside some time and really just observe what's happening around you at the moment, what's going on. Um, your mind's gonna wander, that's fine, it's normal, but you just have to kind of bring it back uh, to, to that moment and, and really just kind of be kind to yourself while your mind is wandering and really just start practicing on living in the moment that you have. And that, that takes time um, and it takes um, work because we are, as human beings, we think about what's next. We we are very rarely putting ourselves um, in a place of mindfulness. Let me tell you the scariest, um, for me, um, mindfulness thing that uh, everyone explained to me. And they're like, Adam, how many times have you driven to work and just not remembered the drive or forgotten chunks of your drive? How many of you have done that? You're like, I'm going to school. And then all of a sudden you're pulling in the parking lot and you're like, holy crap, how did I get here? And why is no one dead? <laughs> like, why is there not just a trail of accidents behind me? Um, because you have just been thinking about everything else, everything else, everything else, everything else. And you haven't been focused on really what's going on. I think that was one of the most salient examples of a time I'm not mindful um, for me. Um, so now I'm very aware when I drive, I can be, which I feel is a good thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, our minds are going to wander and that's okay. That's what minds do. Um, but practice bringing yourself back to a moment without being critical or harsh is, is how you start to do that. There's a lot of different apps that actually help with that. Um, every so on, then I'll be like looking at, um, Insta stories or things like that. And all of a sudden it was like, do nothing for 15 seconds. And it's an app for one of those mindfulness things. I'm like, oh, this is so nice. I love it. The other thing that I do is when my watch, I have an, an eye watch, um, whenever I get that like, hey, you need to breathe and do a breathing exercise. A lot of times it'll be like in the middle of the work day and I'll be like, oh, I don't, well, I'm going to do it. And I take that minute out of my day through that breathing exercise that my watch did. And I was like, clearly, you know more than me, watch. Um, <laughs> and I've just started taking those no matter what where I am the day to kind of have a little mindfulness moment. Um, there's other apps called MindShift, Stop, Breathe, Think. I have a couple, Headspace and Calm. Those are all apps that you can kind of check out to do little mindfulness exercises and things like that um, that, that exist. But really this idea of mindfulness is, is a good idea. Um, questions, thoughts, concerns at that point? That's kind of what I'm talking about when we just have basic stress, you know, that, that happens. It may become a little overwhelming. I think the important thing to know and to realize is that um, sometimes people need help. And it is help that maybe you can't provide as a friend. Um, and it's help that, that they need to seek out. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stigma around engaging in mental health support and counseling services. Um, but I think what is really interesting, a lot of people have a high uh, perception of stigma. They think it is very stigmatized that everybody is judging them. But research actually shows that a majority of people actually have fairly low stigma. There's Everybody, there's a high stigma, but when you survey people, a majority of them actually have a low stigma. Um, so that it's a really interesting gap. So what I would, what we talk about on our campus, how can we start to like close this gap that less people think that there's a high stigma and more people are showing their low stigma um, because that's where nobody's talking about it. That's why stigma still exists as a, as a problem. So <laughs> being in college, um, actually on a majority of campuses provides you access to mental health support that um, doesn't exist in a lot of communities. Um, how many of you pay, um, well, I'm gonna assume all of you pay a student health fee or a student health fee is built into your tuition and fees that you, you do have. Um, so <laughs> that helps you typically fund things like a counseling center on your campus. Um, I think it's really, you'll be hard pressed to find a, an American college university um, four-year institution uh, that have 
type of case report, whether that would be on campus or they have referral services um, to uh, folks in the community. I think that whenever we have friends that, um, that, that need that support or whether we need that support, we need to be better refer, referral agents to those supports. Um, I think a lot of times we're really scared to say to someone, hey, maybe you should check out the counseling center because we don't want them to feel like that we're judging them. But sometimes people are waiting to hear, hey, maybe you should check out the counseling center um, and kind of uh, uh, being that advocate for people. Uh, I think a lot of times <clears throat> um, we know when things are in high crisis, right? We know when somebody is really in a time of stress and we need to maybe activate something emergency. Maybe they're making statements that are very concerning about harming their self or things like that. We know we need to act in that moment, but it's everywhere else in between where we're not sure. I'm a firm believer that one way of showing you to stick about mental health being and referring people to those services. So your college likely has a counseling center. Um, they likely do individual counseling. They may do group sessions. They may do workshops. They may have specific folks who focus on substance use and abuse, um, crisis services, victim support, things like that. Just a lot of different resources exist on a college campus. I, um, you guys go to a variety of places. Um, but really looking and kind of maybe investing in who does that on your campus is a great first step. Um, a lot of these places and a lot of these services are actually really excited and receptive to student groups reaching out and saying, hey, can you just come into a meeting and talk to us about what you offer and how you could support students on our campus. So even reaching out to them to say, hey, would you like to come talk to our our brothers about XYZ or do you have some printed materials I could share with my organization a lot of that them are they get really good actually <laughs> um, because we want people to engage in those services I think a lot of the things to, to think about is that um, a lot of those uh, college facilities they are not designed to be your long-term primary mental health provider um, and I think that's sometimes where students get really stressed out. They're like, well, they're just trying to refer me and they, they don't want to, to see me. A lot of the work that counseling centers do on campuses is really about brief intervention. So supporting students in like acute times of crisis or an acute need. Um, and if you do need more long-term mental health care and support, they're gonna talk to you about like, let's talk about what resources exist. Let's talk about what's a better fit for you. Um, and a lot of times they're helping you connect to resources off campus as well. Um, so if you would see a counseling center or refer somebody to counseling center and they say, you know what, maybe you should, we'll help you get connected to somebody in the community. That's fairly common and it's okay. It just means that um, the type of support somebody needs is different on what they offer and they're trying to help that connect. I think that I see a lot of strife with students. They're like, they referred me off. And I'm like, well, let's talk about why. And did you ask them why? And um, what's your kind of apprehension around that? And so we talk about those kinds of things. I think the other thing is, is a lot of campuses also have some level of 24 hour support. Um, and what that looks like on each campus is very different. Some people that's a text line, some people have a, a call line, um, some people have you know, chat functions. There's some level of 24 hour support on a majority of campuses. Um, so making sure that people are aware of that. What we know about stress, anxiety, times of mental health and crisis, they don't always happen from eight to five. Um, <laughs> and people need support outside of those hours. And I know that Bong and some other folks, they've posted some of like the national helplines and hotlines and things like that when they've done some other mental health posts. And those are also great resources. Um, but I think the, the important thing is, is that we actually talk about those resources and make sure people know that um, we win people engage in them, comfortable with people engaging in those, because those are things that help us reduce um, those concerns around stigma by just having conversations like this. Like, yeah, we want brothers to engage in these services. We want them to understand that um, stress is real and how um, mental health affects them is very real and that, that we want them to get support. We don't want them to just push it away. We want them to find the help that they need that's particular to them um, is really important to do. So really thinking about how you can have conversations with your chapter, just be like, yeah, it's 100%. We want students to get support. We want brothers to get support um, that they need. And um, we're really um, uh, okay. And we're excited when people do the things that they need to do to help themselves healthy. 
to a lot who are um, sometimes in a really rough spot with their mental health. And we're talking about maybe taking a medical leave of absence or taking a break from college. And I'm like, listen, you can't be here and be successful if you are not healthy and in the mental space to do that. So there's nothing shameful about taking a break right now and focusing on you and then coming back when you can, you can be your best place to be um, to do the work to graduate. Uh, I think there's a lot of stress on, I need to finish in four years. I need to be the perfect student. There is no um, correct path towards a degree in that way. I think a lot of colleges put a lot of pressure on students to graduate in four years and um, things like that. But um, it is okay if you take a, di a different path. And I, I spend a lot of time with students normalizing that. Like, yeah, not everybody has the same path to a degree. Um, you know, people take twists and turns and life happens and things get big and things get small and everywhere in between. Um, and sometimes we just got to do what we got to do. Uh, that's okay. So like, helping people kind of normalize that, that mental health can affect you in college, that it can affect you after college, that it's okay and you know we want you to get support and that we don't judge you for that we in fact think that you're making a great step for yourself is really important to say cool um <clears throat> questions concerns other conversation pieces we have like 15 minutes just to kind of have conversation or our thoughts or things that we would want to talk about you can speak and or type bong ko has a question yeah, sorry. So um, you, you kind of um, helped, I guess, introduce this a bit. So um, one of the questions, this is two-pronged here, um, that was asked, and we often hear about it, is as um, a brother who also holds an office or a leadership role within their chapter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if things are becoming so overwhelming where their leadership role, their responsibilities are adding more stress to, mm -hmm. to their lives. Um, you know, what are your suggestions on working through that? And then the second to that is how, as a brother, how do you, like you notice that somebody's not doing their work and, you know, they're not fulfilling their responsibilities. They're going through things. How do you support them, um, you know, in, in, in need of, of mental health and um, some mental health awareness? Yeah. Um, great questions. I think, um, for the, the first part of that, restate it for me one more time. The first part of that question. Yeah. So, you know, as, uh, you know, as students having band, having all of these other activities yeah. in school on top okay. of that, um, you know, how are they supposed to balance or if they are going through a lot of troubles, you know, what are your suggestions to work through some of these, uh, anxiety, depression, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. while being an officer as well? Yeah, I think so. A lot of this goes back. Some of we talked how are we encouraging people to be um, aware of how their stress and things like that are impacting them and then are we also encouraging them to take the steps that they need to, to deal with that right so um, <laughs> I, I from the south hence like the bow tie and I like to share stories and things like that um, I think uh, I was in a four plus one program and um, my Last year, um, I was student teaching, I was working on my master's program and doing all of these things. I was, I made the choice to still march in band. I, I, so I was student teaching, marching, working on my master's work, made the choice to still march in band, um, was involved in my chapter as uh, vice president of membership, and I clearly overcommitted. 100%. And I was just not doing really anything at the best level um, that I could. I was also involved in the mother organization. So I one had that down, kind of took stock of like what my responsibilities were and said, okay, what do I have to do? Well, I have to student teach. I have to graduate. I have to do my work for my, my master's program. Those are things I have to do. Um, what else is really important to me? Well, the band, band and the fraternity are really important to me too. I have to be in band if I'm going to be in the fraternity. So I, I clearly, if, the, if I'm saying that's important to me, I need to maintain that. Um, I'm BPM. Is that important to me? Yes, that's important to me. So I literally said these were the, the things that were important to me. And I began finding ways to let go of some of the other commitments that I had outside of um, kind of student teaching and my academic work band, 
and um, the fraternity um, that final fall semester of my uh, last year of college. And I had to take a really mm, hard look and just being okay saying no a lot. Um, no, they me to as an education association. I said, you know, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm already busy doing these things. Um, it's really powerful uh, <laughs> saying no sometimes and being comfortable saying no. I think that's something that's really hard for us in the fraternity as service-minded people, people who want to give, people who want to jump in. We, we, we don't say no very well, um, but sometimes we have to practice that and get better at saying no when it comes to our own well-being. Um, I also think that, um, you know, this is something even that I did on the National Council, and I know that other people have done on the National Council. So everybody on our council works, they have full-time jobs. Um, they will send emails and say, listen, this we have X priorities at work. I might not be quick to reply to email. Um, if you really have a need for me, please call me. Um, so they're just being open and vulnerable with their their brothers about, you know, these are kind of the, the stressors I have in my life. And I might not be able to do what I need to do, but it's for this time period. Um, so, you know, just kind of being open about those times that you need more support um, is really important too. And it goes back to, I think, what I said earlier, Bong, uh, you know, sometimes we forget that part of being in this fraternity is that we have a group of people to support us and to help us. And if we can be open and vulnerable with them, um, they can do that. But sometimes we, we do need to be okay saying no. And, and that's tough. Um, and that's a tough lesson, especially for service-minded folks like people in Cap Cap Psi. Um, the other point, like if I see someone, how do I help them connect? So the first thing that I will say, um, and I, I really want to drive home is the difference between I statements and we statements. If you ever heard somebody about you having concern for them, please, please, please just talk about it from yourself. I am concerned about you. I have noticed this. I have seen that. The word we is a very big word for only two letters, especially when you tie it to a fraternity. Um, the moment that I say we, um, if I'm approaching a brother, it could mean Everybody in my new member class could mean the exec board, could mean the entire fraternity. Um, so really keeping it from a personal focus, one, because that's the only person you can really speak for most of the time is yourself. So it's being uh, honest. And two, it's a little less overwhelming for somebody um, instead of hearing this we. So I think it's about being very open about what you saw, but also being very open about what they say back. So if you see somebody who is struggling, like, um, I'm just going to role play here with Bong. I'd be like, Bong, you know, I've noticed that you, you a little struck me. You seem like you have uh, taken on a lot right now. I just have some concerns about you. Um, I wanted to tell you about them. Is, is there anything I can do to help you out? Bong can say whatever Bong's going to say, and he might say, I appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, I would love that. Bong might say, nope, I'm good. <laughs> Literally, he might say that. And, you know, when they say, nope, I'm good, that's when I just say, okay, uh, you know, I just wanted to make sure you knew I, I was worried about you. I care about you. And if you need anything now or in the future, just let me know. You know, and the last thing that we need to be doing is adding more stress to somebody and hounding them. Um, so really speaking from a place of genuine concern, um, speaking just for yourself, um, speaking about how they get to tell you how that, that you help, um, and then kind of being okay with what they offer back. Um, sometimes people are like, yeah, I, I am stressed. I really just need somebody to vent to and listen. Yeah, I can do that. Or, yeah, really to learn more about services on campus. Do you know where I can go? Yeah, I can help you figure that out too. So really just kind of being open to what they put back and not badgering someone um, because somebody just might not be in a place where they're ready to discuss it with you. Um, they might not be in a place where they're ready to discuss it with themselves. So we can't expect people to kind of respond the way we want them to respond. We just need to be open to what they say. Other questions? Thoughts, musings. I think what I would put to you then as students is, what do you think is probably um, 
something that you hope your brothers would say to you or things that what could, you know, other brothers may watch this. So what are some things like, what, what would you want to hear from brothers and leaders if you were having uh, anxiety or stressful moment? There's no <laughs> expectation of losing anything about yourself. Uh, need to worry. But if you were stressed out or having an issue, what, what do you hope people would say to you? So that our brothers watching can maybe get an idea of what they could say to individuals. For anyone to answer. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start while the others are thinking. For me, um, sometimes it's just nice to have someone who will just say, hey, I'm just here to listen. I'm not here to give you advice. I'm not here yeah. to, to comment on anything. I'm just here to listen. Um, and sometimes that's just nice just to, to have that human connection um, without, you know, having somebody to kind of comment and like, you know, put their, their spin on things. It's like this, you know, they're not dismissing it. They're just listening. Yeah. And it goes back, Lacey just typed, you know, simply is just saying I'm here for you. That's a really powerful statement um, to give to someone just I'm here for you, you need help um, is a really important thing. Um, well, it's right here. Uh, it's okay. It, wanting to hear that it's okay to feel the way that they feel and that feelings are valid. Um, yeah, I, I get, you want to talk about a way to like take me from like zero to a hundred. If like I'm upset or sad about somebody and somebody's like, well, you shouldn't be sad about that. I'm like, excuse me. Yes, I should be like, I'm allowed to be sad about something. I'm allowed to be stressed about something. Um, you don't get to tell me how I feel. Um, I think that, that really, um, helping people just hearing that, you know, normalizing that whatever you're feeling is okay. However you're feeling in that moment, you know? um, what may be perceived as an overreaction to you or an underreaction to you is just their reaction and that's all right. Um, so I think that's a great point. It's okay to feel that way. Um, and, and that's totally valid to feel the way that you're feeling right now is really powerful to say to people as well. Um. Just being open to, uh, <clears throat> to being vented to, <laughs> like, hey, if you ever need to vent, let me know. Um, there's at least three or four people in this chat that know that I like to vent, but um, literally, like, all you do is vent and you feel better, at least yeah. for me. Like, if I just talk about it for three and a half minutes, then I can just forget about it and move on with my life. I agree. I'm also sometimes a venter, and a lot of times when I know I need to vent, I will literally say to the person, I'm calling you to a vent. I don't want you to problem solve. I just want you to hear. And I kind of set that expectation. Like, I just, I just want to like, like Katie here and word vomit you for a while on with my, and, and that's just what I need right now. Um, and I, I think that's a, a great point. Sometimes we have to be prepped if we're going to vent with someone, if we're receiving the venting, we have to be prepared to not, um, problem solved. And that's really hard to be like an active listener and not trying to immediately problem solve. So that's why I sometimes just frame it to people like, I just need to get this out. I don't expect you to have an answer. I don't even want to talk about an answer right now. Maybe we can do that later. Um, but I need to vent. Um, Jessica Needham wrote, uh, it can be nice to hear external validation about who you are and your value. Sometimes you get into the battle with yourself internally. So having someone say, hey, I really appreciate the work you've put in your position. Our chapter is better because of you um, can be uh, the ammunition you need to take down those negative thoughts. I completely agree. Um, I um, am a big believer in the thank you note. I send a lot of them here around campus and in my work. I love a thank you note. Just making sure people understand that they're valued and their work that makes a difference. And also, um, how we recognize when people are overworked and overstressed and how we can help with that. You know, um, if it's a really high stress time, you have three games back to back, there's a demo performance maybe in the middle of it, your concert band is having a concert, you know, those high, high stress times going into your next chapter meeting and just like, hey, this week, these past months have been really hard and stressful. Here's cookies, you know, things like that. Just so people know that you are kind of all in this together and that your work matters and that everybody is working really hard right now. And we recognize that and things like that. So, um, cool. Anything else before we wrap up?
Well, I appreciate you all spending time with me from various points across the places across the country. I know we have New Mexico, California, Washington, D.C. now, and Indiana. Lacey, where are you from? I'm from uh, Louisiana. Louisiana. Serena, Nino, um, and Jessica, where are you guys from, Nino? I am from Florida. Florida. Serena, Jessica's Florida, um, and Ohio for Serena. Well, thank you all. Coast to coast. We hit, we hit ocean to ocean today. I like it. So. Awesome. Well, thank you all. And I'll turn it over to Bong. I don't know if he has anything to wrap yeah. up. With, so. so, no, um, thank you all so much. Just a couple of notes here. I'm most likely going to take a, a picture of all of us. So if you, you don't have to be on camera, um, if you don't want to, but I'll, I'll take a picture and I'll, I'll count us down here in a bit. Um, but at, uh, first off, thank you so much to Adam for taking the time out of his schedule to, to speak on this. Um, you know, me picking this was based on the feedback that I've received from students. Um, you know, our goal is to provide content that's going to be helpful for you, things that you need, and that's going to look different throughout the year. That's going to look different from year to year. So please uh, reach out. Please continue to provide your feedback. Um, I'll be sending out a feedback form, a survey after we get off this call. So please fill that out. Again, your, your feedback does really help us out. Um, and, you know, if you have suggestions on topics that you want us to cover, um, you know, things that resources you want us to go uh, deeper into. I know one of the big topics right now um, tying into mental health is uh, our chapters developing this mental health chair. Um, so that's, you know, I, that's something that, you know, we can start to collaborate um, with different chapters on as well. So uh, thank you all so much. I'm going to take a picture here and let me set this up real quick. Adam and his bow tie. It's right. Tuesday. I wear them on Tuesdays. <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Uh, be on the lookout for this, uh, the email with the survey. Um, again, thank you to Adam and have a great week, everybody.